Hey everyone, Happy New Year! So, a while back, did you see those rumours about a proposed NVIDIA 2060 GPU that wouldn't be an RTX card and so presumably wouldn't support ray tracing or any of the other new Turing features? Yeah, that turned out to be complete rubbish as the RTX 2060 is here and it is indeed a full Turing model. Priced at $350, it's got RT features, it runs DLSS and it supports variable rate shading. It's the full Turing feature set, just shrunk down for a lower price point. But yes, shrunk down obviously means lower performance, which raises the question of just how capable this card is going to be. The answer? Well, it's pretty good actually. Yes, $350 means that the RTX 2060 is a lot pricier than the old 1060. But as we shall discover, performance is solid. So at the nuts and bolts level, what is the RTX 2060? Well, looking at the card itself, and yeah, we have the Founders Edition here. It's all looking very similar to the 2070 FE. And that's because it's using a cut down version of the same TU106 processor. The board itself retains the same HDMI 2.0 and USB-C connections as the other cards in the RTX lineup. But in common with the 2070 FE, there are just two display ports and a dual link DVI. The inclusion of DVI? Yeah, for a card primarily aimed at 1080p and 1440p gaming, I'd say it's a good port to have. Power is delivered with a single 8-pin power input, again in common with the RTX 2070. Build quality is pretty decent here overall, in common with the other founders cards. And there is the sense that you're getting a premium product here. There's a 160 watt TDP, so this is a fair step up from the GTX 1060 kind of sitting between 1070 and 1080 instead. So, in terms of the silicon itself, the 2304 CUDA cores of the 2070 are paired back to 1920 for the 2060, so that'll be 83.3% of the full complement. Memory bandwidth is cut down, however. We're on a 192-bit bus here with 336 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. That's not too far off the GTX 1080 actually, thanks to the transition to GDDR6. So paired with Turing's memory compression improvements, pretty good match for the performance on offer. In terms of ray tracing prowess per Nvidia's Giga Ray metric, the specs are pretty clear. We're at 50% of the prowess of the 2080 Ti, 62.5% of the 2080, and again, 83.3% of the 2070. Can it run Battlefield 5 ray tracing then? Well, the recent patch from DICE improves performance from launch dramatically. Still looks phenomenal. And so Nvidia cites 1080p gaming here at full ultra settings with ultra DXR at 60 frames per second. So here's the thing. Strictly speaking, I don't see anything wrong with that claim, but I kind of feel the implication is that you're always at 60 frames per second or better. That's certainly not the case. Now, of course, the funny thing about frame rate averages is that they're exactly that, averages. The game could conceivably run at 35 frames per second. If there's sufficient content running elsewhere at much higher than 60 frames per second, and this will then average out. Bottom line though, I demand a 60 minimum, and uh, the reality is that as things are right now, the 2060 doesn't deliver that. So here's the thing, Battlefield 5 was, I suspect, built with a specific render budget in mind for all of the specific content. And you know, by and large, certain features add on additional costs that scale according to the settings you choose and, of course, your chosen hardware. From what I can see, though, the render budget balance DICE established without RT features enabled is blown to pieces once it is enabled. Some scenes run beautifully smooth at 1080p, others are far, far heavier. I'd really like to see some kind of dynamic resolution scaling in effect here. Again, I only had limited time for testing and I'd quite like to return to it, especially since a ton of extra overhead will be given once the game gets a DLSS patch. Bottom line though, a bunch of users were predicting disaster with ray tracing being pointless on the lower end RTX cards, bearing in mind the first game to utilize RT is running and producing a decent albeit far from flawless experience, well, I think developers just need time with the new hardware. 
The bottom line is that in time, cards like 2060 and 2070 will form the bulk of the RTX user base, and so it would be madness not to produce experiences that run well on those products. But yeah, the performance enhancing DLSS will certainly help there. Speaking of which, let's crack on with a look at how well the 2060 utilizes some of those other new Turing features. DLSS is the technology that uses a deep learning algorithm paired with Turing's tensor cores to effectively upscale the image. You're looking at Final Fantasy XV here, running at 4K on max settings. And I'd say that whether you're using TAA or DLSS, you're going to get dips under 30 frames per second here. But to be fair, all of the GameWorks features are enabled here. And in real life, actually playing the game, Turfworks or Turf Effects or whatever, that's the only one I'd actually recommend using. Bottom line though, the results are fascinating. In this benchmark, the GTX 1080 outperforms the RTX 2060 with TAA, but with DLSS active, we get frame rates that are just 6% short of the RTX 2080, running with TAA of course. That's a 39% boost to performance. A similar thing happens in the Epic Infiltrator demo where comparing TAA to TAA, yeah, the GTX 1080 is around 3% faster than RTX 2060. However, again, with DLSS active, the performance uplift brings frame rates closer into line with the 2080. And just a reminder here, the 2080 is pretty much on par with the GTX 1080 Ti uh, in performance terms. Not bad, but yeah, it's all going to come down to image quality, really. Something that we'll be looking at really soon when more DLSS content is available. Based on what I'm seeing with Final Fantasy XV though, I'm optimistic about this technology. Another new Turing feature worth discussing is variable rate shading. I'm not going to go too deeply into the details of how this technology works. Alex did a superb video about that, which I shall link in the video description below. Why spend precious resources rendering pixels you're not likely to see, whether that's in like darker areas or in fast motion? Reduce the complexity there lower frame rendering times and get higher performance. It's that simple. So I'm going to compare the RTX 2060 to the GTX 1080 here using the first game to support the feature, Wolfenstein The New Colossus. This is a modern game engine and even without VRS active, the 2060 can outperform the 1080 by just a touch, but 1080p is about 3% faster. There are VRS modes that target either quality performance or a little bit of both. And yeah, that balanced mode is the default and at higher resolutions, basically a match for the performance mode. However, at 1080p, there's clearer scaling. As we move through each mode, we essentially gain three to 4% more performance. At best, VRS adds around 11% to frame rate in our New Orleans test run. With this feature then, the RTX 2060 can best the GTX 1080 by a maximum of 15%. Yes, only one game supports VRS at the moment, this one. But variable rate shading is a feature that has been coveted by developers for years and it's finally here and I expect it to be supported more widely. All of which leads us on to rasterization performance. So thus far we've seen the Final Fantasy XV benchmark see the 1080 outperform 2060, while Wolfenstein 2, even without VRS, sees the opposite, 2060 moves ahead of 1080. So for a $350 card with all the bonus Turing stuff, this isn't bad at all, but just how fast is it when we take a look at more titles? I actually think we have a winning package here, but actually pegging how fast the 2060 is compared to a specific Pascal card isn't easy. What I can say is this, similar to other Turing cards, we are seeing a big price bump for the new product. It is $100 on top of the 1060's $250 asking price. But in fairness, it is a ton faster, obviously. Let's have a quick look at a legacy title, Crisis 3. The 2060 delivers 56% more performance for 40% more cash. It's 57% faster than RX 580 and 42% faster than RX 590. Shadow of the Tomb Raider here next to represent a more modern game. 2060, 59% faster than the 1060. 52% faster than the 580, and there's a 40% uplift over the new RX 590. NVIDIA is presenting the RTX 2060 as its new 1080p champion, with excellent 1440p performance as well, but really this card is a replacement for higher tier offerings. 
1070, 1070 Ti, 1080, these are kind of better comparison points. So yeah, the 1070 is left for dust and essentially we're looking at a performance level that sees the RTX 2060 match or exceed 1070 Ti while getting very close to 1080 performance, matching it or even beating it in some scenarios. I'm not going to dwell too much on the AMD side of things here, but suffice to say that the 2060 poses problems for the Vega cards, bearing in mind its $350 price point. Out of 11 titles tested across 1080p and 1440p resolutions, the 2060 is faster than Vega 56 in 10 of them. Only Far Cry 5 at 1080p sees the 56 move slightly ahead, and only then because of a performance spurt of sorts at the beginning of the bench. Otherwise, like for like. Across the run of play, the 2060 also does a fairly good job of keeping pace and sometimes mildly exceeding Vega 64 as well. And yes, that's with the AMD cards rebenched from scratch with the latest drivers. Even AMD's established champions, like Battlefield 1 under DX12, see the 2060 pull ahead of the Vega 56 at 1080p. Though curiously, the 2060 loses pace at 1440p and 4K, with Vega gaining more performance relatively. But one thing I've noticed is that the 2060, just like other Turing cards, does tend to run better on more modern games, even if we look at earlier and more recent entries from the same franchises. So let's take a look at Assassin's Creed Odyssey here. Fascinating results. The 2060 is effectively on par with the 1080 at 1440p, or slightly slower at Full HD. Up against the 1070 Ti, it's on par at 1080p, but faster at 1440p. So yeah, remember when I said it was hard to peg the new card up against a specific Pascal model? Good example here then. However, in the old Assassin's Creed Unity, built on the same engine, an older version of it obviously, any advantage the 2060 has against the 1070 Ti vanishes at both resolutions, and the GTX 1080 obviously has a clear lead. You can see something similar in the last two Tomb Raider games as well. If you take a look at the rise of the Tomb Raider benchmark, we actually see one of the rare examples of the 2060 being beaten by the 1070 Ti. And believe me, this doesn't happen very often. Whether you're at Full HD or 1440p resolution, 1070 Ti has a 3 to 4 percentage point lead. In this game, GTX 1080 also takes a commanding lead, 14 to 15 percent, depending on the resolution. However, Fast forward to the recently released Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The situation changes somewhat, and again, it is using a more modern version of the same engine. RTX 2060, 9% faster than 1070 Ti at Full HD, 6% faster at 1440p. By extension, the GTX 1080's lead over the 2060 is taken down to 4 to 5%. So yeah, that's kind of the performance delta you can expect, pretty much around the 1070 Ti to 1080 area. So if Rise of the Tomb Raider is something of a weak spot for the 2060, how does the older 1070 compare? I mean, that was something of a landmark card, delivering Titan X Maxwell performance to the mainstream. Well, even on Rise, the 2060 is still 13% faster, and that increases to around 20% with Shadow. That's a solid chunk of performance then, for a $350 product. But yeah, it's the newer games where uh, Turing generally performs best. Now, uh, Crisis 3 is, and probably always will be, in our legacy title selection, and it caused some hiccups for the RTX 2080. Something a bit similar is happening here. It's a couple of percentage points slower than the 1070 Ti, regardless of the resolution you're playing at. You'd be unlikely to notice the difference in actual gameplay, but what it does mean is that the GTX 1080 has a huge lead here, around 16%. Now compare and contrast with Wolfenstein The New Colossus. Now we've already seen that at 1080p, the 2060 inches ahead of GTX 1080, and it's 10% faster than 1070 Ti. It's also where it posts its biggest leap ahead of GTX 1060, delivering an astonishing uplifting performance of 75%. Tune VRS to performance spec, and remember this feature is not available on Pascal, and that lead extends to 92%, almost a doubling of performance. Now this is an outlier at the moment, but if you cast your mind back, 
to GTX 780 Ti versus GTX 980 right at the launch there. Wasn't much in it in performance terms, but as the Maxwell architecture matured, it left the old Kepler cards like the 780 Ti in the dust. Maybe the same thing will happen here. So I think we have a measure of the 2060's performance then. As I said, it's kind of like a spectrum of frame rates that ranges from a touch under the standard set by 1070 Ti to a touch over GTX 1080, depending on the game. But how does it stack up against the rest of the RTX lineup? So this is an interesting one. Nvidia is really positioning this as a 1080p card, but come on, 1070 Ti, 1080, those are 1440p champions. All of the benchmarks I've done are using an i7 8700K with an all-core turbo at 4.7 gigahertz, and that's a ton of CPU power there. But the bottom line is that we can hit CPU limits which are influencing the result. So, case in point, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, really CPU heavy this one. At 1080p, 2070 is only 12% faster than the 2060, with the 2080 delivering only a 21% boost. Those figures increase to 15% and 30% at 1440p and rise again to 23% faster for the 2070, 47% for the 2080. So what's happening here is that as we scale the resolution ladder, the CPU is less of a limiting factor and the GPUs have more room to breathe. Bottom line though, even the 2060 can hit CPU limits, even with a fast 8700K. So check out this Crisis 1080p benchmark. We've got the 2060 stacked up against GTX 1070, which is less powerful, as we've established, and then more capable RTX cards. Now notice where the graph lines intersect there. At this point, you are getting identical performance from all of those cards, and that's because we are using the same CPU, which is hitting the same limit. And yeah, really, that is an 8700K, 4.7 gigahertz, all-core turbo. It's stupendously fast. So on less capable processors, I'd seriously recommend 1440p as the minimum for general gaming to remove that CPU bottleneck. Okay, so let's wrap up. 1070 Ti uh, to kind of 1080 performance for $350 with the promise of DLSS and VRS on top. And yeah, ray tracing too. Overall, I think this is a strong deal, but let's be clear here. What it doesn't deliver is a Pascal level generational leap in performance but it is well priced for the frame rates it delivers compared to existing cars on the market. And yeah, what I would like to see is an actual 1060 successor at the $250 price point. I mean, let me be completely clear here. I'm not particularly excited by AMD overclocking the RX 480 again, but the resulting product, the RX 590, delivers anything up to 16% more performance than Nvidia's offering in that price range. But for $350, yeah, I think the RTX 2060 is well worth considering. Anyway, that's where I'm going to finish up for now. As always, please do like and subscribe to support the work we do here at Digital Foundry. Ring the bell for instant notifications whenever a new DF video emerges from our labs. And yes, a big shout out to our loyal Digital Foundry Patreon supporters. You're helping out far more than you probably realize. Anyway, that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did, and I'll see you soon.